There were no books in the house, uh, f three or four, uh, that had been given as gifts. But, um, and I was the only one who read them. Uh, but my mother read uh, a lot in the evening, for an hour or so, and she had, she would rent books from the local pharmacy. And so I used to go, she'd give me the name of the book, and I used to go to the drugstore and get the book and give the guy the quarter so she could have it for five days. So I saw her reading in the evening. But um, books weren't in, weren't in any of the houses in the neighborhood where I grew up. And I read them, and I enjoyed them. And then I went into more serious books. And I began to read when I was probably 12, and I came upon books I'd never heard of before. And I, and my brother also had some of them in paperback editions. He would have been 19, I would have been 14. Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, um, Ulysses, and um, that changed everything. I had leaped forward into adult reading. But I wasn't intimidated by it. Of course, I was intimidated by Ulysses. I don't think I got past page 20. What, what I liked very much was, was one line, one line in um, Ulysses that made a deep impression on me. It'll show you how childish I am. Um, at one point, Bloom goes down, the hero of the book, goes down to the, to the waterfront of the shingle to watch a girl down there, Gertie McDowell, I think her name is. And uh, he goes down to watch her, apparently this isn't, is not the first time. And she's young and pretty, and uh, he puts his hand in his pocket, and he has cut the lining in the pocket so his hand can go right through to his privates. And so Joyce tells you what's going on, but you still don't get it until the next paragraph begins, at it again. I loved at it again. I think it should be on my tombstone. At it again. The Penn Literary Service Award honors a writer whose critically acclaimed work has drawn a wide audience and helps us to understand the human condition in original and powerful ways. Unlike other Penn Literary Awards, the recipient receives a rare book and the monetary prize supports Penn's programming. Tonight, I'm delighted to announce that Annette and Joseph Allen have generously undertaken the continuation of this important award for Penn, now in its seventh year, to be called the Penn Allen Foundation Literary Service Award. <clears throat> Philip Roth has, in his own words, dedicated his life to the novel. During a career born in controversy, his caustically intelligent, elegiac, transgressive, and brazenly honest writing has probed the frontiers of the form, laying bare the constraints of kinship, religion, and social convention. His output has been prodigious. In more than 8,000 pages, over 31 books, written across 54 years. He has spoken to us through achingly memorable fall guys and whipping boys, from the ebulliently ribald Alexander Portnoy, which launched him into the literary firmament in 1969, through David Kepesh, Mickey Sabbath, and Nathan Zuckerman, to the fictional Philip Roth. He has been deservedly garlanded with awards, Pulitzer, National Book, Penn Faulkner, Man Booker, and Gold Medal for Fiction. He's been invited twice to be honored at the White House in 1998 to receive the National Medal of the Arts from President Clinton, and in 2011 to receive the National Humanities Medal from President Obama. His influence on our literary culture has been profound. Indeed, that grand jury of popular sentiment, the readers of New York Magazine, recently voted him America's greatest living novelist. 
A few months ago, just shy of his 80th birthday, Philip Roth finally announced his retirement. He'd actually put his pen down in 2010 after completing the novel Nemesis. But he wanted to be sure the retirement took before announcing it to avoid becoming the literary equivalent of Frank Sinatra. <laughs> now, in the morning, when he gets up, he strolls over to his computer and takes a look at the yellow post-it note he has stuck to its screen. It reads simply, the struggle with writing is over. Relieved, he turns away from the emotional exhaustion of wrestling with the novel and, a and attends to other matters, his well-thumbed copy of iPhone for Dummies, for example. Mr. Roth has said that in coming years, he, still, he has still to face two great calamities, death and a biography. His stated wish is that the former precede the latter. But that now seems unlikely as he has turned state witness to a biographer, Blake Bailey. To Roth, it feels a bit like working with an FBI agent. Blake Bailey is here tonight, possibly wearing a wire. Ms. Mr. Bailey, where, where are you? Are you here? There, there. Could you open your jacket, please, and uh, be patted down by Penn staff? As for the former, when researching his novel, Sabbath Theater, Roth observed a local Connecticut gravedigger at work, and his thoughts turned to a venue for his own burial. But when he expressed interest in a vacant plot near the graves of his parents in Newark, the cemetery, su the cemetery superintendent quickly nixed it. I don't like that for you, Mr. Roth, he said solemnly. There's not enough legroom. To which Roth conceded, well, that's important because I'm going to be here a long time. <laughs> I suspect, though, that Mr. Roth's cemetery trawl was premature. After all, his latest published piece a couple of weeks ago was a eulogy to his freshman high school teacher in Newark, Dr. Bob Lowenstein, who died at the sparkling age of 105. It's not just in his own high-octane writing that Philip Roth has shown his commitment to creative freedom, though, but also in his support of his colleagues, and that is what I want to highlight tonight. It started in the early 1970s when Roth visited Prague as a literary pilgrim on the trail of Kafka, and it continued with his report for Penn on the deplorable lack of literary freedom in Czechoslovakia, and then over two decades of helping writers living under oppressive regimes across Eastern Europe. On his own initiative, Roth set up a labyrinthine system of literary money laundering with a dozen different aliases to funnel monthly stipends to persecuted Czech writers and intellectuals. The money came from his own pocket, as well as from those of his friends and colleagues, including Arthur Miller, Bill Styron, Edward Albee, Alison Lurie, Gore Vidal, John Hersey, Jerzy Kozinski, and Arthur Schlesinger. To the Czech writers they were funding, Roth has said, he felt an allegiance. We were all members of the same guild. In 1974, perturbed that so many great authors from behind the Iron Curtain languished unread in America, Roth founded the Penguin series, Writers from the Other Europe. For 15 years, he served as its general editor, helping to introduce to American readers some great East European writers. From, po from Poland, Bruno Schulz, Tadeusz Konwicki, Jerzy Andrzejewski, Tadeusz Borowski, Witold Grombowicz. From Yugoslavia, Danilo Kish. From Hungary, Georgi Konrad, Geja Schott, and from the then Czechoslovakia, Milan Kundera, Ludwig, Va Ludwig Vatsolik, and Bohemil Herabal, and of course, Ivan Klima. In doing all this, Philip Roth has served as a role model for the writer as activist, reaching out across cultures and continents to champion the cause of oppressed fellow writers. It's an honor for me tonight 
to introduce Philip Roth as he embarks upon his next quarter century. At it again. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Thank you, Penn. And thank you all. From 1972 through 1977, I traveled to Prague every spring for a week or 10 days to see a group of writers, journalists, historians, and professors there who were being persecuted by the Soviet-backed totalitarian Czech regime. I was followed by a plain clothesman most of the time I was there, and my hotel room was bugged, as was the room's telephone. However, it was not until 1977, when I was leaving an art museum where I'd gone to see a ludicrous exhibition of Soviet socialist realism painting. It was not until that sixth year that I was detained by the police. The intervention was unsettling, and the next day, heeding their suggestion, I left the country. Though I kept in touch by mail, sometimes coded mail, with some of the dissident writers I'd met and befriended in Prague, I was not able to get a visa to return to Czechoslovakia again for 12 years until 1989. In that year, the communists were driven out, and Václav Havel's democratic government came to power, wholly legitimately, not unlike General Washington and his government in 1788, through a, through a unanimous vote of the Federal Assembly and with the overwhelming support of the Czech people. Many of my hours in Prague were spent with the novelist Ivan Klima and his wife Helena, who was a psychotherapist. Ivan and Helena both spoke English, and along with a number of others, among them the novelists Ludwig Watsulik and Milan Kundera, the poet Miroslav Holub, the literature professors Denyek Stribrny, the translator Rita Budinova Milnarova, whom Havel later appointed his first ambassador to the U.S. And the writer Carol Sidon, after the Velvet Revolution, the chief rabbi of Prague and eventually of the Czech Republic. Together, these friends gave me a thoroughgoing education in what unstinting government repression was like in Czechoslovakia. This education included visits with Ivan to the places where his colleagues, like Ivan, stripped of their rights by the authorities, were working at the menial jobs to which the omnipresent regime had maliciously assigned them. Once they had been thrown out of the writers' union, they were forbidden to publish, or to teach, or to travel, or to drive a car, or to earn a proper livelihood each at his or her own calling. For good measure, their children, the children of the thinking segment of the population, were forbidden to attend academic high schools. Some whom I met and spoke with were selling cigarettes at a street corner kiosk. Others were wielding a wrench at the public waterworks. Others spent their days on bicycles, delivering buns to bakeries. Still others were washing windows or pushing brooms as a janitor's assistant at some out-of-the-way Prague Museum. These people, as I've indicated, were the cream of the nation's intelligentsia. 
So it was, and so it is, in the time of a totalitarian system. Every day brings a new heartache, a new tremor, more helplessness, and yet another reduction of freedom and free thought in a censored society already bound and gagged. The usual rights of degradation, the ongoing unmooring of one's personal identity, the suppression of one's personal authority, the elimination of one's security. A craving for solidity, for one's equanimity in the face of an ever-present uncertainty. Unforeseeableness as the new norm and perpetual anxiety as the injurious result. And anger. Anger. The, the maniacal raving of a manacled being. Frenzies of futile rage ravaging only oneself. Alongside your spouse and your children, imbibing the tyranny with your morning coffee. The toll of the anger. Totalitarianism's ruthless trauma-inducing machine cranking out the worst of everything. And over time, everything becoming more than one can bear. One, one amusing anecdote from a grim and unamusing time, and then I'll be finished. On the evening of the day following my encounter with the police, when in haste I wisely left Prague for home, Yvonne was picked up from his house by the police and not for the first time questioned by them for hours. <clears throat> Only this time, they did not hector him all night about the clandestine, seditious activities of Helena and himself and their cohort of troublesome dissidents and disturbers of the totalitarian peace. Instead, in a refreshing change for Yvonne, they inquired about my annual visits to Prague. As Yvonne later told me in a letter, he had only one answer, one, to give them throughout their dogged night-long inquisition about why I was hanging around the city every spring. Don't you read his books, Yvonne asked the police. As might be expected, they were stymied by the question. But Yvonne quickly enlightened them. He comes for the girls. <laughs> Thank you. First time Philip visited us at the beginning of the 70s. He came many times and his visit meant a lot, a great help for us. When he came first time, I invited many of my friends, all of us, were entirely forbidden and and it was real such intellectual support for us that such important great American writer came visited us and listened uh, our uh, narration about the information about the situation of Czech intellectuals at the beginning of the 70s, uh, when uh, Philip you started to come, uh, it was after the de defeat of the Prague Spring and after the heavy purges 
when all the Czech intelligentsia was dismissed of their positions and many brilliant uh, spirits had to serve in all sorts of menial jobs. So it was a time of uh, uh, depression and uh, the arrival of uh, such a person like Philip was a real support, it was a real spiritual support. And uh, Philip was uh, no interested not only in political situation, but in uh, human conditions and in human stories, in human fates. And it was uh, uh, really uh, so, so pleasant for us, because at the time many of us were deprived of the possibility to, to do our jobs and, and, to, also, speak. and to speak. Our, our neighbors were taken for interrogation and many friends were uh, persuaded by the police not to befriend with us. So when uh, Philip came, it was wonderful. <laughs> and it was a real support, not only spiritual, but it was a support for the literature and for intellectual life as, as well. And uh, so we are thankful to Philip and uh, we wish him many happy years.